Det er ikke gerne i sæsonen. Far. It's always dangerous, I feel, when I have a, a microphone in my hand. I feel an instant need to start singing to people for some reason. <laughs> I was on a panel session at VMworld just uh, two years ago, and there was three of us, each with a mic. And uh, I said, shall we do a little Rat Pack number, you know, a little bit of Frank Sinatra? And the other three guys looked at me with just sheer terror that I might actually start to <laughs> launch into a song. But you're, you're OK. Um, this particular presentation is all about uh, my lab environment. Um, I joined VMware, I said earlier, about six months ago. And my focus back before I joined VMware was very much on Site Recovery Manager, on Vue, and on vSphere. I installed vCloud Director just once in my entire existence on version 1.0, wrote a little article about it, uh, vCloud in my man cave, and then never touched it again. So what I've been doing for the last six months is sort of embedding myself in vCloud Director, trying to learn more about it. I think I'm getting to the end of that process now. I think the next thing I'm going to probably look at is vCloud Automation Center. Is the next thing I'm going to look at. I'm kind of doing a big survey of all uh, sort of cloud products. But um, what this session is, is all about is uh, how do you learn about vCloud Director? How would you shape your lab environment, if you have one, on lab, to learn more about this product? and learn more about cloud generally. Uh, I think one of the big challenges of cloud just generally is you usually think of cloud as massive scale. Lots and lots of servers, lots and lots of storage. That doesn't seem to be what most people have at home in their home labs. Um, so it's a challenge to try and step up to the plate to actually do it. I've mentioned this book already, but I will mention it again. Um, before I launch into it though, I, I want to ask the question, um, why is it that people have home labs? It's quite popular in the VMware community to have a couple of PCs at home, or maybe some big PC running ESX on those PCs. You know, what's wrong with us? Don't, don't we get enough IT during the day that you come home at night or when you can on the weekend, you're doing it as well, unpaid? Why, why do people have home labs? Passion. Passion, that's one reason. Practice. 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 I can do some crazy stuff <laughs> that you wouldn't be able to do in a production environment. Maybe is uh, what we can't know it. I've had 24 hours after. I guess another reason is prepping for any certifications. You know what all those things add up to? They add up to career advancement, don't they? It occurred to me a couple of weeks ago that I've really had a home lab since the age of 23 when I first got into IT. Back then I used to teach uh, people who didn't know the difference between the shift key and the space bar, how to click with the mouse and how to use Lotus 1, 2, 3, that's what my first IT job was. And I had a PC at home where on the weekends I would install other bits of software I didn't know anything about, Excel or whatever, and I'd try and learn those in my own time in an effort to basically learn more, pick up more courses, pick up more money, develop my career. Um, where I hit a roadblock is I wanted to learn networking, you know, Novell Netware, 311, coaxial cabling, yeah. 10 meg. Didn't have any of that kit at home, so I used to go into the office on the weekend in our little lab environment and play there in order to learn Novell so I could persuade my manager he should put me through the c &E. So I figured I've been doing it all my life, but it's not something that's new. But I wonder whether we're entering a new phase in our industry that the days of big companies sending you or me away on expensive training courses to learn about products that they have bought is going to come to an end. Um, there just isn't the money for it. Increasingly in the UK and elsewhere I go, the burden on uh, you know, learning new things isn't something that the company is remotely interested in taking on. It's, it's your problem. You know, here's the new product, just learn it. Um, some of that's always been there, you know, uh, how many of you learned a product because a consultant came in and you sat by the consultant and watched what they were doing and asked them a few questions. That's been historically the way sometimes people have learned. So it's not the most rigorous or the most kind of you know, exacting way of learning, but on the job learning as you're doing it is how a lot of people do, do sort of learn, don't they? 
Uh, I guess another way of learning is you read a chapter of my book in the toilet and then you go off and speak to a customer. After you've spoken to the customer, you then go for another loo break and you read the next chapter of one of my books and you come back and speak to the customer again. Believe it or not, I've heard of people doing this. Yeah? For the customer, it looks, must look very strange. You must have some sort of bowel problem, you know. Uh, every time you get to a really important part of the configuration, it's like, let's go to the loo. <laughs> anyway, uh, the next step is, yeah? Um, but I think increasingly the burden is on you, and maybe having a home lab uh, to run this kind of stuff is the way that you're going to do it. Second thing I would say is, some people would say to me, you know, the business I work for has no interest in cloud, or no interest in SRM, has no interest in virtual desktops, whatever it is. And what I say to those people is, are you going to let your business, your company that you work for, lack of vision, now dictate what you learn and what you do for your future? Just because they're not interested, does it mean that you shouldn't be? And are the skills that you're learning in the home lab today the ones that you'll be using with your next employer, not your current one? That is the reality. Yeah. I used to come to this business in the 90s, nearly every month with a new idea and a new product about what we should be doing. And without fail, the management went, that's a very nice idea, Mike. But we'll wait until you know, we can actually see that this particular technology is getting some traction on the marketplace before we invest in it. Yeah? And without fail, they missed the boat every single time. Because by the time they realised there was money in the thing, that ship had already sailed. Yeah? Uh, I'm not saying I'm any visionary at all, but it's just, you know, sometimes I felt a bit frustrated. Uh, I worked for a technology company that was prepared to just sit and wait until things had already become big before they'd want to get involved. And of course by then, the big kind of benefits to the company or career-wise had already gone. Just my uh, point of view. So, um, I'll take you through this, I won't bother reading out the agenda. I thought it might be useful for anybody who doesn't know vCloud Director to kind of have a quick overview of some of the terms that are involved. Um, so, um, we have this thing in vCloud Director that's called the provider VDC. It's basically an aggregator of resources. Um, the provider VDC can contain many clusters, and that's what gets presented to the tenant. Yeah. In case a 32 node cluster with a terabyte of memory on every single ESX host isn't enough for you, you can actually have a provider VDC that has many clusters inside it. So it's designed for massive scale. What the tenant gets is something called an organization VDC, yeah? much smaller allocation of those resources, and they have no idea of the underlying vSphere, networking, storage layer at all, completely abstracted. We have these things called pools of networks. Yeah? These pools of networks are pools of VLANs, pools of vCloud uh, network isolation pools, and nowadays pools of VXLANs if you want them. And we have this thing called, which isn't shown, a VAP network, which can connect to an organization network, which can connect to an external network, and then off to the internet. My, my joke about this in one of my blogs is it's a bit like that song, you know, the, the knee bone connects to the leg bone, the leg bone connects to the ankle bone, you know that song? No? Not heard it? Sing for us. <laughs> it's all about the body, you know, the skeleton, you know. So I sing, you know, the VAP network connects to the organization network, the organization network connects to the external network, and the external network connects to the internet, and here, you know, anyway. <laughs> it probably doesn't translate. But it, it's uh, different layers of networking that you could have. And VAP networks aren't mandatory, you could just connect to the organization network if you wanted to. You could even connect directly to the external network if you want to. So it's very, very flexible. You know, if you think distributed virtual switches and standard switches are very flexible in the way it can be designed, you ain't seeing nothing else when it comes to vCloud Director and things like it. So uh, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy called 2003, my first attempt to install ESX2 was to a Dell Optiplex PC, which was underneath my desk in my home office, and it was an unmitigated failure. Yeah? Uh, the reason being is ESX2 only recognised IDE controllers on IBM blades and PCs just weren't supported. 
So my only alternative was to go to my OEM provider of choice called eBay. Yeah. And I bought two Dell PowerEdge Pentium 3 boxes with two gigs of RAM. Yeah. So I'm probably one of the few people in the VMware community that's actually run the ESX kernel on Pentium 3. This is a claim to fame. Yeah. I even had a little uh, j -board, a deck j -board, with SCSI cards and SCSI cables going to this j -board, so I was able to do V-motion from one of these ESX hosts to another. So my other claim to fame is I'm the only person who's done V-motion with Pentium 3 processors using a deck j -board. I mean, this is kind of, I don't know, 1996, 97, NT4 clustering era kit that I'm doing V-motion with, you know. So, impact on my girlfriend, Neil, we weren't living together. Uh, as my lab environment grew over time, it started to become a bit of a, I don't know, a tension between us in our relationship, as there always is in relationships. Um, so, um, I think before I went to a co-location <coughs> facility, my lab ended up being a, uh, a Sun Storage Sun, full ProLine servers, and a gigabit switch. So when she used to come round to see me, I had to switch it off because it was too noisy. Yeah, because you know when you're getting romantic with your significant other, you know candlelight, all that stuff. <laughs> it just it just really is a killer. You know, uh, if, well, I don't know why it's music to my ears. <laughs> Um, in the end, uh, things got so out of hand, I had to move to a co-location facility. I'm now at this place in the UK called Node 4. We have a number of locations. Um, I've got uh, two uh, Dell Equalogix, uh, a fiber channel uh, switch, uh, two NetApp filers, a bunch of uh, ProLines. I've actually added a few, and I've even got some Lavono hardware in here. I used to have some uh, EMC. NS120 and an NS30. Um, in the end, I shipped that back to EMC to try and produce more space for, for servers. Um, it, it costs me, out of my own pocket, about 870 British pounds a month to run this thing. And uh, that's after the VAT is taken off. Uh, I still have my own limited company. I'm still fat registered, so I can claim back the VAT. But this is, this is a second mortgage. Uh, I could probably buy another house with this kind of money. Yeah? Instead it goes up in smoke running servers. So increasingly I look at this and I think, can I afford to carry on doing this? Are there not more cost effective ways of, of doing this? Because uh, this is coming out of my salary. Uh, admittedly some of it is covered by sponsorship, but not all of it. I've got a couple of sponsors on the site which is helping. Uh, impact on girlfriend, uh, we're getting married. Yeah? May the 4th. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're not having bridesmaids. We're having the stormtroopers from Star Wars. Yeah, no wedding march. But <laughs> oh, no, I'm joking. I couldn't possibly get away with that. Uh, the only problem I have now is uh, my my wife to be looks at this and thinks that's a lot of money. I go, yes, it is. She said, uh, well, we could have a new car or we could go on holiday with this. So I have to sort of explain to her that I kind of need this quality of environment to do the work I do, without the kit, I can't do the work I do, and it's a bit tricky trying to persuade my employer to pay for this, because it's like, well, this is your junk, Mike, it's got nothing to do with us, you know, so uh, I'm starting to wheedle away at my boss a little bit, to say, look, I've done my best, I've covered half the cost to ads, could VMware see me the other way? Um, the other thing I like about this setup is it's got NetApp and Dell in there. So that, that's good relationships with those vendors, their plugins, all that kind of stuff. I'd love to get some EMC BNX in there, sort of 2U, 4U, just to have a mix you know, of different storage vendors to keep my SRM stuff going. Um, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a huge burden. And I, you know, although VMware pays me so much money, I'd still rather that 850 was in my pocket than you know, going to Node 4. So let me give you an idea of what my former setup was like. In fact, probably the easiest way of doing this is give you some pretty pictures. Yeah. So in this single rack in the UK, I had two virtual centers. One for New York, yeah, NYC data center, and one for New Jersey. 
Um, my first book on Cyber Recovery Manager talked about a city of London and this city called Reading. But the trouble is nobody knows where Reading is and they've never heard of it. And my audience is mainly people from the US, so I picked two locations. And New York and New Jersey are very popular locations for primary locations because of Wall Street. But also, I shouldn't really move around, should I? I should stay still. I'm, I'm here. Giving the camera some more to you. Yeah. And New Jersey is a proper D, popular DR location. Um, I don't know if that's still true after Hurricane Sandy, but you know, there we are. And I would do that mapping stuff I was talking about earlier today, you know, mapping my VLANs to this VLAN, yeah, for SRM, and mapping clusters and resource pools to this cluster and resource pool in the DR location. If you've if you bought and read any of my books, thank you very much, uh, you might recognize some of the screen grabs here because that's where they came from. All of this in a single rack, so I was cheating. It made it look like I had facilities in New York and New Jersey. You can type in any old level, can't you? And then this new era started when I joined, I joined VMware, the, the cloud suite era. In fact, um, I've given up on my folder structures where I store all the software, calling them vSphere 4.1. I now call it vCloud 5.1. VCloud 5.1.1, VCloud 5.1.1.1.1, A, B, C, yeah, or whatever it is called right there. Um, so what did I do? Well, first thing I did is I dispensed with the Windows-based virtual center altogether. Um, that was quite nice because it meant I escaped the SSO issue on the Windows version of virtual center, which I know has caused a lot of people problem. SSO on the virtual center appliance works out of the box. Yeah? It's a joy to use. Yeah? Um, obviously more of a challenge on the Windows version. Yeah? Um, main reason for doing this was to reduce the footprint. I wanted to squeeze down the number of ancillary VMs I had to increase the amount of memory I had for my tenants. Um, so um, I got rid of my Windows SQL box and rid of the Windows VC and ended up with just one appliance. Yeah, works perfectly fine. The only thing I would say is to be careful with this is although the APIs behind the virtual center server appliance are exactly the same as the Windows one, you don't get linked mode, you don't get roles replicated because there's no linked mode, and you don't get license data replicated because there's no linked mode. And also, a lot of the vendor plugins, which you know, Hitachi were talking about their plugins. A lot of the vendor plugins are Windows based, not designed for this appliance. So if you love plugins like I do, I'm a big user of the NetApp VSC, big user of the Dell integration plugins, maybe you need to wait a little bit longer if that's what you're going to do. But for a lab environment, home lab, it saves you two, two instances of Windows. Yeah. I also use the virtual center, I'm sorry, the uh, vCloud director appliance as well. Um, who here has actually installed vCloud Director manually using the .bin file? Yeah, I've got one individual here. It's like game again. Stick up your hand if you use a product you want. Would you say that's an easy setup to do? Well, if you read the manual, it's quite easy. Yeah, if you read the manual. How many people do that? <laughs> RTFM? Um, there's a lot of RPMs that are needed that may be not there by default. The certificates to be set up. A vCloud director instance has two network cards, one for the portal and one for creating a window on the VM, so it's multi-NIC. Certificates should be generated, although you can use self-signed certificates, and there's a back-end database configuration to be done as well. Uh, initially just Oracle, then Oracle and DB2, and I think now SQL is supported as well. Um, it's not the easiest of setups to do. I mean, if I was doing it for production, I'd just learn, read the instructions, and I'd follow it. But if your intention is just, I want to use it, I don't want to worry about the setup of the actual service, this uh, virtual appliance is an absolute godsend. Yeah? The only downside I would say is it doesn't support multiple servers or multiple cells. So it's a single instant service. If it goes down, you'd have to reboot it, try and bring it back up. And it's not supported in a production environment. Yeah? Uh, it's demo only, training only. The one thing I wish it had, which it doesn't have, is an update facility. So if a new version of vCloud Director comes out, there isn't a little tab where you click update and it upgrades the appliance for you. You literally have to deinstall vCloud Director, delete the appliance, and download the new one. Yeah? Um, which I must admit, I got burnt by that. I deployed the 5.1 version of the appliance 
only to find three weeks later that 5.1.1 version came out. So I had to undo a lot. Fortunately, I hadn't really got that far along my journey, and therefore it wasn't that difficult to go into reverse, go back to the beginning, download the new version of the appliance, stick it into forward, stick it into first, and carry on. I used the V-Shield virtual appliance, that's mandatory. I also decided to deploy the vSphere replication appliance and the data protection appliance, mainly because I thought, well, I can import them. If I don't need them, just power them off. When I do need them, power them on for demo purposes. But also because, as you heard earlier, I'm a passionate believer that cloud needs backup and cloud needs DR. It stands to reason that if we're going to get these features, we're probably going to get them through these particular appliances. And therefore, I wanted to sort of familiarize myself with them to begin with. But certainly not mandatory to have them to, to learn more about VTime Director. One of the things that sort of troubled me though was how I was going to carve up the vSphere environment. Yeah? Because as you saw earlier, the vSphere environment I had was very much geared around SRM, yeah? based by application, based by business unit. It wasn't based by or structured around the idea of how cloud should be done. Yeah? Um, I was very lucky. I was able to more or less level my environment and start again from scratch. That's not something that most customers can do because they've got an existing environment. But I, I started to think about the cluster and the VMware cluster and whether the VMware cluster itself is beginning to almost be like the new silo, you know, the, the new boundary that people rub up against. And what got me thinking about this was a new feature in vCloud Director 5.1, which is related to that provider VDC. Originally, the provider VDC could only contain one cluster, which just sort of begged the question, why does it exist? It's just an object, which points at another object at that point. In 5.1, VMware allowed us to have many clusters added to one provider VDC, which obviously kind of makes more sense, because it's then comes that kind of aggregator. But it started me thinking about, well, when you create a new VM, how does it know which cluster to put the VM on if one provider contains many clusters? But also, how do we go about moving VMs from one cluster to another? Now, at this point, I'm going to try and do two difficult things, which is uh, draw, hold the mic, and do something with the iPad. So uh, I hope you're impressed by my dexterity. But this is what I'm getting at. A lot of people see the cluster, let's say you have more than one, as a kind of silo or boundary, if you like. So you have a number of servers in here, and each of the clusters have a discrete set of networks, and also a discrete chunk of storage. Why do we do this? Why do we partition out if we have multiple clusters? I mean, in fairness, some of you might only have one cluster, so it's a bit of a silly question to ask. But for those of you who have multiple clusters, why, why do we do this? Different hardware. Different hardware. Yeah, this, this could be Intel. This could be AMD, couldn't it? That's one reason. Any other reasons? Licensing. So you might have horrible licensing <laughs> to concern yourself with. Any others? Separate fault domains. Fault domains for different business units. Or this could be test. And this could be prod, for argument's sake. Or business unit one, business unit two. Out of curiosity, does anybody have a LUN which is visible to both clusters at the same time? Stick up your hand if you do that. Yeah, it's interesting. If you not, look around if you, if you, there's a number of people. Keep your hands up, please. Keep your hands up. So there are a number of people here who are doing this. Can I ask, why is it that you have this swing LUN, as it's sometimes called? If, if we have this boundary between one cluster and another for reason, why, why is that done there? Mm. 
I've got LUNs like this, so it means one of my VMs can be moved from this LUN to this LUN to this LUN and then moved into a different cluster. Yeah? Um, because I've got AMD and Intel, I don't have to power off the virtual machine to do this, obviously, because Intel instructions do not get executed on AMD processors. And if they did, the AMD processor would go, what the hell is that? Yeah? <laughs> it's an Intel instruction. Yeah? So we have sort of created these boundaries between the clusters. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong or right, but what I am saying is this. Isn't it interesting that we as virtualization people who want fluid workloads, yeah, all that kind of stuff, have created these boundaries that are essentially based on hardware, different LUNs, different VLANs, different network switches on different servers. Isn't that ironic? This vision of the software defined data center that we as a community have used hardware tools to create these sorts of boundaries. Yeah? And that's the tension I felt when I was getting into this vCloud thing. Part of me wants to do away with the silo mentality, um, both for politics reasons, but also for flexibility of moving workloads. But part of me has a foot in the old world as well, where I want to keep things separated and control them. Can't I use software tools to do that kind of partitioning? Do I have to use hardware-based tools to keep things separate? Isn't that the bad old world? Am I trying to get to this nice new world where everything's just softly partitioned because it's more flexible? I'll say no more. Yeah? There's a gap between our vision and what people actually might do. So this is what I ended up doing. I created two clusters, gold and silver. Yeah? No New York, New Jersey anymore. Gold and silver. Mainly because the ProLiance are AMD based and my Livorno <coughs> servers are Intel based. So there's an interesting point straight away. Even if they'd had exactly the same amount of memory, exactly the same hardware profile, I would be forced to keep them separate because of the CPU difference. And I thought, how revealing that is. Maybe when you come to deploy the cloud director in a production environment, you have this uh, abstract vision of how you want to dot out your resources, and then you hit up and rub up against the physical world and the physical limits. Yeah? Uh, maybe you're forced to keep things separate because you have absolutely no choice. It was interesting that uh, when I asked why do people silo, the first answer was because of hardware differences. I forget who, who said that. I thought, yes, because that's what I have to do. Yeah. So um, I ended up with one site, two clusters, AMD and Intel. I do have this thing called the infrastructure resource pool. Um, this thing here. Inside the infrastructure resource pool is my virtual center, my domain controllers, my vCloud director, my vShield manager. One of the things that's recommended if you're using vCloud director is a dedicated management cluster, separate and discrete from the resources that the tenants are consuming. But in a home lab, you probably won't have that luxury. You'll have to run your management layer on the varying cluster that your tenants are using at the same time. So, as a precaution, I created a resource pool, set high priorities on them, and did memory reservations to make sure that whatever happened, if I said deploy a million VMs to four ESX hosts, at least the management layer would still give me control again. Yeah? That has some interesting consequences when you first set up the cloud director, but more of that a bit later. Um, my goal was to maximize the resources, hence using appliances where possible. Yeah. And what really forced the separation was the differences in the CPU. Yeah? Um, there were other resources that were in my mind as well. The AMD ProLiance are actually older than the Livonos and don't support VLockstep or VMware FT or any of those fancy features, but they do have more memory. So I was sat there thinking, well, the Livonos have less memory, but they have more modern CPUs with more attributes. But the AMD servers have more memory, but fewer attributes. Which one matters to me? In the end, I decided that the more memory really mattered. VMware FT only allows you to protect up to a maximum of five VMs on one cluster, five primaries. That's hardly cloud scale, is it? You know? 
I'd have to say I could only have five tenants and you can have one VM protected. I mean, it's just not worth thinking about. Yeah? Unless it scales up to hundreds of thousands, what really matters is the memory. As it always has done in the world of virtualization, as it always has done in your home lab, it's memory, memory, memory every single time that you run out of, isn't it? Not CPU, not bandwidth, not even storage sometimes, but just pure RAM. So the next thing I looked at was storage. Yeah, um, I have a number of kind of infrastructure data stores. Yeah, and I also have my templates and uh, software data stores. The local storage I'm not really using just yet, but I might use later on with vSAN and distribution storage. And then I created four tiers of storage. Yeah, platinum, silver, gold, and bronze. Yeah, you'll find this funny. Initially, I started off not with seven tiers, but 14 tiers of storage. Yeah? Literally 14 different layers of storage. Yeah? And the first tier was replicated every five minutes. And the second tier was replicated every 20 minutes. And the third tier was replicated every hour. And on it went. Um, some of it was SAS, some of it was SATA. Some of it was on NFS. Some of it was iSCSI. Some of it was the MFS. I created this wonderfully complicated engineer's view of all the different ways storage could be presented on a piece of paper. And then I went, stop. Yeah. I'm making this far too complicated for the consumer of these resources. And the analogy I used for this was like when you come to buy a new mobile phone. I don't know what it's like here in, in Poland, but if you go to the UK and you go into, I don't know, Vodafone shop, and you say, I want a new iPhone, what tariffs do you have? The salesperson will go, we've got this very simple card that explains all our tariffs. And then it goes like this. <laughs> yeah, as it folds out. Uh, like the way the comms providers show their tariffs is so complicated, it makes it almost impossible to compare Vodafone to another vendor. It's, I think it's deliberate. Because the customer just looks at them and goes, that one. Yeah? Or whatever the salesperson says. But isn't the point of cloud meant to be simplifying the way resources are consumed? If we offer 26 different tiers of storage, whoever is creating those VMs is going to get that list of 26 and then go, which one should I use? The one with the most free space. <laughs> <laughs> We're back where we started, aren't we? Yeah? So um, I, I had to simplify it. Um, Platinum turned out to be NetApp with uh, fiber channel connectivity, SAS. Stepmer enabled with replication. Gold was um, Dell, iSCSI. SAS again, um, replication one an hour. There really isn't that much difference between my NetApps and the Ecologics. The difference is, is my fiber channel pipe is two gig, but my uh, iSCSI and NFS pipe is only one gig. That's really the only functional difference between them. Silver was NetApp on NFS and SATA, and so was the Dell. I deliberately put the Dell at the bottom of the list, not because I don't like Dell, but what I don't like is people seeing NFS as a kind of substandard, sub-quality storage system. There is this kind of mentality that exists both in storage land and within the VMware community, that somehow fiber channel storage is the racehorse of storage, yeah, and that uh, iSCSI is the pony of storage, and that NFS is the knackered old donkey on the beach kind of storage, yeah. And I think this is wrong. Um, I defy anyone to show me that a 10 gig connection through to an NFS file, I say from NetApp, is any less performant than fiber channel, yeah. The differences are in the attributes. Do you want VMware's file system, VMFS, or do you want NFS in some of the attributes that it has? I think try and suggest that fiber channel, because it's photons that travel at the speed of light, is somehow superior to Ethernet, is a bit crazy in the world that we now live in. Yeah? So I deliberately would not put NFS at the bottom of the list. I, I tried my best to try and put it at the top of the list by VMware. The other thing I did was enable vSphere replication, and here's why. Oops. 
<coughs> excuse me. I obviously have two SAS based arrays from two different vendors. That's not meant to say SARS, it's meant to say SAS. And they are being replicated to much bigger in capacity SARTA arrays. So even if I replicate all of this over here, all of this over here, I'm still left with a certain amount of free space unutilized. Yeah. This became platinum, this became gold, this became silver, this became bronze. And I realized this was NetApp and this was Dell. And there was no way I was going to be able to replicate between two different array vendors of, of a different sort. So I thought, why not offer a tier of replication here, which is actually software-based using VR? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I had this idea of simplifying the storage, but again, when it came to actually doing it for real, it was the hardware world that started to make me do it in different ways. <coughs> I think it's interesting, the more you try and get away from the hardware, the more it kind of raises its ugly head. Because you're dealing with physical realities at the end of the day that are... You can't just wish it all away. We're not going to end up with an empty data centre if it all becomes software. You know? Tumbleweed drifting through our data centres. So, um, I did have some anxieties about the way this storage was being done. Um, as I mentioned in the DR session, I worried about Site Recovery Manager and all these tenants using the same storage. Yeah? The so-called noisy neighbour idea. Yeah? So if you think about it, Go back to my little uh, PowerPoint slide here. If I've got uh, tenant A and tenant B, both using the same provider, which is presenting the same storage, doesn't that mean a guy here could generate a lot of IOPS to this volume, which would affect one of my other tenants, yeah? Wouldn't I get worried about the performance impact when they're sharing the same storage? It's like, I don't know, my SQL admins share the same data store as my exchange guys. It's the same kind of tenancy issue where you have those mixed together, yeah? The trouble is, is if you start thinking that way, I realize this, every organization I would create would get its own gold, silver, bronze, and whatever storage card out from the ray that was unique to it. And so if I had four tiers worth of storage and ten tenants, that would be 40 lungs for me to create and also set up for application. So I was back at that being the engineer, wanting to design the perfect system from an engineer's perspective, but then it becoming more complicated than I really wanted it to be. And I think that's the heart of any cloud work with virtualization. You want to make it simple, but at the same time, the engineer in you wants to make it complicated. Because the engineer in you thinks about all the complexities of trying to design the perfect system where nothing could ever possibly go wrong. Um, I think these sorts of challenges would exist even if you weren't using VMware software. Yeah? That's why I think this is important. because. It could decide, you could decide to go somewhere else for your virtualization and your cloud, but these problems are not going to go away because they're fundamental to this way of thinking and operating. The question is, is which vendor helps you satisfy both at the same time or helps you make a compromise between the two? I personally think it's VMware, but I would say that I'm paid to. From a network perspective, I ended up doing this. I created a uh, infrastructure distributed virtual switch and I created a virtual data center virtual switch. All my tenants are here whereas the vSphere layer is here and there's two network cards that back each of these distributed switches and they are actually uplinked to totally different switches. The infrastructure layer from vSphere is plugged into a Dell PowerConnect switch that I got given to me when Dell they didn't give me, they lent me the Ecologics, but they've never asked for them back, so make of that what you will. Um, the uh, virtual data center DB switch goes to a 48-port Netgear that supports about 60-odd VLANs. How interesting. I'm against silos, aren't I? But what I've done is taken two separate network cards and plugged them into that switch, and two network cards and plugged them into a totally different switch, and then I've linked them again, so I can actually manage one from the other. 
So the very man who was arguing a moment ago against the bad idea of the silo kept it separate. Why did I do that? My, my worry was is that I might make a change on one of these distributed switches, a casual change, which then would affect all my tenants. Or I might do something in vCloud Director where I hadn't really engaged the brain, which would then affect my underlying vSphere infrastructure as well. What was at the heart of my mind when I was doing this is um, my call location is about a 30 minute drive from where I live. So it's an hour there and back, obviously. And my remote access into this lab environment is through VMware View. Yeah. Guess what ESX host it runs on? The same ESX host I offer up to my tenants. So I was a bit worried that if I did something stupid, I'd be like that man sat on a tree on a branch with a saw in his hand, yeah, making a change, making a ah! and finding that I had to get in the car and go to the call location. Um, if I'd had, or if I had other methods of gaining access that was completely independent, I'd perhaps be a bit more cavalier. But knowing that I could make a stupid mistake made me a bit more cautious here than I would perhaps ordinarily. I got rid of standard switches, I don't use them at all. Yeah? Although bear in mind there are some features in uh, vCloud Suite that still require the standard switch. Yeah? Um, example, uh, endpoint the antivirus offloading system still uses standard switches, not distributed switches. So you can't get rid of them completely if you're using all of our stuff. Yeah. So goodbye standard switch. Um, it was always a struggle trying to use standard switches and distributed switches at the same time, especially if you've only got four NICs. Trying to offer fault tolerance to both different layers and keep the separation is harder. It was actually easier to go all standard, all distributed switch. But what made me switch to the DBS is all of the nice advanced features of vCloud Director require distributed virtual switches. Yeah? Uh, it's essentially a product that requires enterprise plus licensing to get the most out of it. I'm not saying that you have to, because you can actually run it on different SKUs, but you lose quite a bit in terms of features. Yeah? So I needed to go down this particular route. Yeah? Uh, I think the switch configuration is probably the least contentious thing I did because I could have done that with standard switches. I've always kept my management network separate from my VMs. It's just an extension of that. So um, I guess I had the same anxieties about networking. You know, I've got tenants sharing the same networking, but in my experience, even if you're only one gig in your environment, you very rarely use 10 or 20% of that. About the only time I've seen gigabit environments really heavily utilised is when you do vMotion or if you're using iSCSI. So as long as you put them on separate NICs, it doesn't really affect performance. But my main worry is about fat finger syndrome, where I might make a change and then screw things up. That's what made me keep it separate. So some lessons learned. Yeah? When thinking about the provider VDC, don't just think about the compute memory. Think about all the resources compute, storage, and networking. What does that cluster offer? And you'll have to weigh up whether the storage access is more important than the amount of memory that you've got available. Think of the cluster as a, a whole. Um, my gold uh, cluster doesn't have any FT. I decided that FT was simply not important to me. Yeah, meant to compromise. If you are um, installing and using vCloud Director for the first time, 5.1, 5.1 assumes that you've gone through the vSphere setup for VXLANs. If you haven't and you create a provider VDC, you'll get red exclamation marks in the pools area as it tries to find your VXLAN configuration in vSphere, which isn't there. Yeah? It's not the end of the world, you could just ignore the little red exclamation marks. But if you're a fan of green ticks rather than red exclamation marks, and let's face it, we all love green ticks in our world, then go through the VXLAN configuration first before you do anything with vCloud Director and you'll have a smoother experience, especially if you're doing demos. The other thing I found is the v, uh, VCD ESX agent. When you create a provider VDC for the first time, you select a cluster and then vCloud Director puts the uh, agent on every ESX host for vCloud Director. Yeah. It does this by putting every single ESX host in the cluster into maintenance mode at the same time. Okay. So let's say you've just got one VM powered on in the cluster. <coughs> Every ESX host gets put into maintenance mode at the same time. 
what will happen? What happens if every ESX host is in, put into maintenance mode, but you've got one powered VM still running on the cluster? What will happen? Well, what happens is, I'm sure you've all seen this, it goes to 2% and then it sits there. Because once every ESX host is in maintenance mode, there's no place for DRS to put that VM anymore, is it? Because that's what's stopped. When you're in maintenance mode, you can't do a motion anymore. Now, I think whoever wrote that bit of software assumed that your cluster would be blank and have no VMs on it, or they would be all powered off. Now, in my lab environment, because I didn't have a dedicated management cluster, that wasn't the case. My domain controllers were still switched on, my virtual center was switched on, and of course, I needed vCloud Direct to switch on to actually do this in the first place. Yeah? I think that has some interesting consequences for people who are trying to roll out vCloud Direct in an existing environment that isn't blank. Yeah? Now, it's not the end of the world. Weirdly, what happens is, some of them go into maintenance mode so quickly, get the agent installed and then out of maintenance mode that the install is successful. But one of the two of them fail because there's a VM that it can't move off quick enough. So you're left with, I don't know, 10 years exhaust. Eight of them were successful and two of them have an error message. It's not the end of the world. You right click the host in vCloud Director, say prepare for vCloud Director. Because the others are out of maintenance mode, the VMs get moved off and the agent gets installed perfectly fine. But as a first time experience to somebody who's new to vCloud Director, it's like, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah? And I guess what might have been nicer is if the system knew there were already VMs on the cluster that were powered off, why not do two at a time or one at a time until all of them were done, yeah? rather than trying to do all of them simultaneously. Yeah? It, it strikes me that the person who wrote that bit of you know, software had a blank cluster and therefore has never seen this error before. But I had the experience straight away. So more lessons learned. Get your VLANs sorted before you use them in VCD. Now, I'll fess up here. In my books, I've written about uh, VLANs, VLAN tagging, and I've done it in production environments. But my own home lab doesn't have VLANs. It was just a flat network. Yeah? Um, it was only when I got into VCloud Director that I decided I really need to VLAN this up now because VLANs are so heavily used by VCloud Director. A single flat VLAN zero network wasn't going to work for me. So I, I did this thing. On the physical switch, I created VLAN 11. Yeah. On the virtual switch, I created a port group with VLAN 11. And then in vCloud Director, I created an external network that used VLAN 11. Everything was fine. And then I thought, you know what? I really don't like 11 as a number. Yeah, uh, I find 10 a nicer number. So I'll go back to the physical switch, make it 10, go back to a virtual center, and back to vSphere, make it 10, refreshed vCloud Director, it said 10, but actually that was wrong. In the database, vCloud Director still thought it was 11, when actually it was 10. The UI was lying to me. Yeah? The database said something else. Then when I went to use VLAN 11, it said, I can't do this. It's already in use. But it wasn't on the physical switch and it wasn't on the virtual switch, it was buried in the database. So I asked my colleagues, what do I do? And I was given two choices. I could either use Oracle tools to edit the database to remove the Duff entry. Given that I know nothing about Oracle, I was a bit mm, not too sure about that. Or I could delete the original network, add it back in, and it would fix the error in the database. Yeah? If I hadn't have been so casual about my, ooh, uh, let's make it VLAN 11, maybe I wouldn't have faced this situation. So think about how you want your VLANs laid out, because if you go around making casual changes to lurk floor down the stack, you can get duff entries in the database. I, I think this will be eventually addressed by some sort of software patch. Right now, there's a KV article about this. Get your IPs sorted out. Um, this is what my network is like currently. My external network is using 192.168, my organization network is using 172, and my VAP network is using 10. Um, it's almost the wrong way up. 
because my largest network should either be 10.x, the external network, or if I was a, a cloud service provider, that external network would be 8 or 16 genuine IP addresses for the internet that my tenants would use to allow themselves outbound access to the internet, but also reverse inbound connections to their web servers. Yeah? Why did I do this? Um, well, you know when you buy a home router and you stick it in a home, guess what IP ranges they tend to use? 192, 1682, I'll like, oh, just use the same. But when it comes to my screen graphs, it looks insane. Yeah? Um, I'd prefer my external network to be 83, 82, 84, 85, as if I was an ISP or a service provider, or use the standard class A, class B, class C addresses. So the smallest network would use 192, 168, whatever, because VAP networks might only have five or six VMs in, if that. Yeah. It sounds like a common sense thing to say, but you know, I've actually seen in production environments people get this wrong already. Yeah. So they bung in some IP addresses and then they go, actually, this doesn't make an awful lot of sense, does it? IP ranges can be tricky to change. Can you see, uh, here I have a VAP network, which is powered off, all the VMs are powered off, but the option to change the default data and the subnet mask are grayed out. I can change the DNS settings and the ranges of IP addresses that I use, but I'm not allowed to change the default gateway. And it isn't because I'm not the sysadmin. I've got full rights to this environment, but I can't change the default gateway. Yeah. Now, I think there's a little bit going on here about trying to protect the administrator from doing something stupid. Yeah. Or put another way, is how often do you go to your core network, your Cisco routers, and go, you know what, the default gateway IP address, I don't like the fact that it's 11. I prefer to be at 1. Yeah, and you go into the Cisco router and you change it, and then about 5,000 people go, why can't we connect to anything anymore? We don't tend to make casual changes at the core network, do we, without thinking about the consequences. So I think the reason it's dimmed is to stop you doing something stupid, like changing the default gateway, and then having 20 or 30 VMs that are all statically configured for a totally different gateway address. When they're powered back up, they can't communicate to the outside world, and then you have to re-IP, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or a hundred VMs in that VM, yeah? Um, I think you should be able to change this, but I think when you go to change it, it should say, now type in a four-digit PIN to confirm that you should do this, and please type in your name to confirm that you were the person making this change, or select your name from the list. So you should be forced to know what the consequences are, yeah? So, that's fine on a VM network, but when you're dealing at an organizational level or at an external network, those IP ranges are not so easy to change so casually and so quickly. So a little bit of pen and paper, yeah, or iPad and pointer if that you prefer that, mapping out what you think the network should be, what the VLAN should be, what the IP ranges are, will save you a lot of time. VApps and the Edge Gateway. The Edge Gateway, which is this appliance here, does support netting, firewalling, and also static routes, where you allow communication to take place between one network and another. If you power it off, the VAP, it also destroys the edge gateway and all your configuration, which is not needed. And when it's powered back up, it's then reset to be a clean instance. Yeah? So all that work you did to type in IP addresses and DNATs and SNATs and so on is lost. So if you want to keep all of those changes, remember this little tick off button here, retain IP and MAC addresses. When you power off the VM, you don't lose your configuration, and all of that configuration is brought back again. Yeah? Um, I kind of feel that tick in the box should be a default, because a lot of people don't know what the consequences are. Establish a meaningful naming convention. How many times have you heard vendors say that to you while on training courses? I once worked in an environment where all the servers were named after the dwarves in Snow White. Yeah? There's a meaningful naming convention. Of course, nobody wanted the sleepy server, yeah? or the dozy server, because you know, they were uh, bad. This guy here is a man sucking an egg. Yeah? So what I'm getting at here is vendors always try and you know, 
get their customers, like grandma, to suck eggs. They tell them the absolute obvious, and you all sit there thinking, yeah, yeah, I know, a meaningful name you mentioned. But the reason we bleat out about this so much is you'd be surprised how often it doesn't happen. Yeah? So I've got an example here of where I've used a consistent naming convention throughout the process with a path ping yeah? from one VM in one VAP in one organization to another VM in another VAP in an entirely different organization. And what that allows me to do is troubleshoot whereabouts the network commons is failing. So a VM here in the organization called COIG, Cobb Overseas Investment Group, yeah, is communicating by its IP address across its own um, VM network. It then goes across its own organization network, this third IP address, and then travels across the external network down into the organization network of Corp HQ. Yeah. Across the VM network for the uh, web based VM until it arrives at the web destination. If any one of these just stopped, I would know at least whereabouts in that communication I had a misconfiguration or a failure of comms. Yeah. As soon as you don't have the naming convention, what you have is a bunch of IP addresses and you sit there thinking, well, which ones it is. Because vCloud Director has pools of IP addresses that are just automatically assigned and then taken back when you no longer need them, the days of us knowing, yeah, 172.168.5.15 is the web server, is kind of going. Because I bet some of you actually know the IP addresses of a lot of the nodes on your network, don't you? Yeah. You are very sad if you were. <laughs> but I used to be like that. Oh, yeah, it's one, uh, 192, 168, one, 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 you know, I know it's that particular node. But in this new world where networks are created, destroyed on demand, IP addresses are grabbed from pools, handed back to the pools, are you actually going to know all these IP addresses anymore? Perhaps not. Maybe the core ones, for the core network that never changes. But in this more dynamic world, I think having a good naming convention going to save you a lot of time. And I'll stop going on about how meaningful the information. OBFs, the Open Virtual Machine Format, are they as open or portable as they could be, or we think they are? Have a look at this error message here. A virtual system in the OVF file is being uploaded requires an unrecognized virtual hardware version. What is a virtual hardware version in the world of VMware? What, what are VM hardware levels? Does anybody know? But basically every edition of ESX, major edition, has increased the number. So we're currently on hardware level 9. Yeah, yeah. But vSphere 4 was hardware level 7 and 8. Depending on, I think 5.0 is 8. And these hardware levels, they're... Actually, hardware levels comes from workstation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, you know, the, the, it's, not, it's like a numbering system that has nothing to do with the, the platform and everything to do with all the different products. Yeah? Um, so, what I was trying to hit, do here was take a vSphere 5.1 VM that I had exported into an OVF file and I was trying to upload it to a public cloud vendor who is also using vSphere and using vCloud Director. The trouble was they were using vCloud Director 1.5 and they were using vSphere 4.1. So you know when you go through that wizard to create a new VM and it says, do you want this to be compatible with 2, 3, 4 or 5? Maybe you're going to have to be a little bit more careful about what you're selecting because if you want to move that VM from a very new environment, yours, to another person's environment, how do you know whether they're on the same version as you? Now, we obviously get forward compatibility. You could be on old, and the public cloud vendor could be on new, but we don't have backwards compatibility. A version 9 hardware level VM cannot execute on an ESX4 host. Well, it can. You edit the VMX file, and you tell it it has a totally different hardware level, which is a totally unsupported thing to do. Yeah. But it will work. Yeah. As long as that VM doesn't actually request hardware level 9 features of a host that could never provide it, it would actually function.
but that's an extremely dangerous thing to do. Um, but you could, for want of a better word, frig it, re-engineer it to make it work in that direction. Yeah. What I think is interesting on our vCloud portal is you can sort the vCloud partners by region, by size, but there's no drop-down list that says show me the ones that are on vSphere 5.1, vCloud 5.1. One of the things I've been arguing uh, in the business is we should be able to identify partners by what version of the platform they're on. Because, you know, a lot of customers say, you know, there's new versions of VMware commitly. The smaller the cloud service provider, the more likely they'll be on the newest stuff because the smaller you are, the quicker you can move. I've been thinking about this a lot the last couple of days. About that, you know, a new version of a product comes out and it takes 18 months for people to get to it. I don't think that can last any longer in our industry. Um, the fact that it takes that length of time to get an OS from one flavor to another or a virtualization platform to another level, it's not good enough. And if we're going to get the kind of new infrastructures that we want in the next decade, I think upgrades are going to have to become so easy, so trivial, that you treat them almost as if it was like a Windows update to a PC. Yeah, but for the kind of big infrastructures that we've got. That's a huge challenge because you've got to engender and have a system which is so reliable that customers are so convinced of it that they just do the upgrade. Yeah. I think what's more likely to happen is, is that we'll find that people will miss out versions. So I imagine some of our customers are on vSphere 4.1 might actually go and miss out 5, 5 5.1 and go for our next release. Yeah. Simply because they can't keep up with the rate of new versions coming out. Some customers say to me, oh, you know, it's too much coming out too quickly, you know. I always say to them, so should VMware innovate at the rate of the slowest customer? The one that takes the longest to get from one version to another? That's a recipe for basically staying in the dark ages. Um, but the reality is, is I think a lot of software vendors, and VMware is a case in point, can actually innovate faster than customers can adopt. So I think it's incumbent on the ISVs to make the upgrade process much easier so you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to get from one flavor to another. Anyway, I think I've spoken too much about that already. But uh, watch out for this, you can get version issues. Yeah. So, um, back end of the sort of PowerPoint, I don't know how much I'm over running. <laughs> um, what are you going to do to try and learn more? Yeah. How, how of interest? How many people here do have a lab at home? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is the ones who didn't raise their hands. Why not? Yeah. Um, I think we're moving into this period where having a home lab and having a blog <coughs> and being active in a user group are almost as important as I've got ten years working in an enterprise business. There was a joke I saw today on Twitter. Um, a Dilbert, where this guy is being interviewed for a job, and the, the manager says, I see you don't have your own blog, and you don't Twitter very much, and you're not active on Facebook. Um, I don't know who you are. I can't give you the job. <laughs> but he has 10 years or 15 years worth of enterprise experience. It's kind of balmy, but maybe that's the reality of where we are. So for those people who are considering having your own lab, or people who've got one already, what are your choices? Um, a few years ago, a guy called Simon Gallagher, who worked very briefly at uh, VMware, who's now on the steering committee for the London User Group, won a prize for his thing called VTARDIS. Uh, I guess some of you know Doctor Who? Yeah? The Time Lord? Where the, the spaceship is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside? It's a bit of a joke. Yeah? Well, the idea was a big, big uh, computer with a lot of memory, solid state drives with ESX running inside ESX, so-called nested ESX. Um, your other options, build a big PC, you use that for day-to-day -day use, but you put VMware Workstation on or VMware Fusion on, which supports the running of ESX inside a VM. Your biggest challenge, I think, with doing this is the disk IOPS, yeah? um, especially if you're creating a VM on that ESX host. So SSD makes a huge difference if you can afford that just to take the IOPS out of the equation. Um, as mentioned earlier today by the guy who did the Paris CLI um, uh, session, there's this thing called Autolab, yeah, uh, produced by a colleague of mine, a friend of mine called Alistair Cook in New Zealand, 
which will build you a nested lab of ESX hosts in about three to four hours altogether in terms of you know, downloading all the media and having ready. Uh, last week on my site, lightlaverick.com, I wrote about a company called baremetalcloud.com, which makes me laugh because I'm this virtual guy, but what they actually do is offer people physical service that they can provision as quickly as if they were virtual machines. What they've done is they've taken Alistair's auto lab and basically cloned an ESX host with Clonezilla. It's a free kind of Linux version of Ghost, if you like. Yeah. And they can build you a auto lab in 30 minutes from a, a cloned image. Yeah. And then more or less you, you use that server for the length of time you need it. Uh, when you don't need it, you power it off, delete that physical server, it goes back into their pool. But before you delete it, you can actually create your own image of that server. So if in three months' time you want that configuration back again, you log in, dial up another server, restore your image, and you start working again. I think the bare metal cloud method might be really interesting for people who don't want a, a dedicated lab up form all the time, but they want to spin one up for a certification. It might not even be VMware, it could be Microsoft or whoever, you know. They just need some resources for a temporary period of time. Um, the bare metal cloud people very kindly offered a hundred, one hundred dollar uh, vouchers, of which I think there's about 40 left. So if you're interested, head off to my site, look for Bare Metal Cloud. There's probably a few more vouchers left that people can sign up and get a hundred dollars worth of credit you know, to, to try the service out. Yeah. Um, the other option is to carry on having physical kit at home. One that seems to be very popular is the HP Microserver which is, it looks like one of these NAS boxes, you know, about square, they're yeah, usually filled with SAS drives. Technically, they're only supposed to take 8 gig worth of RAM, but if you use Kingston memory, Simon Seagrave of techhead.co.uk found out that you could get 16 gig worth of RAM into one of those little boxes. The next big question, I guess, is what will you do with storage? Will you get a $50 iMega storage box, uh, free NAS, or even open filer as a way of doing the, the storage. So you could stay on physical and not do any nesting at all. Yeah? So the, I'm trying to give you some ideas of if you've not got a home lab, what you could do. And then there's this other idea that I have, which I've labelled The Inception. Uh, anybody seen the movie Inception with uh, just blank as in? Yeah, DiCaprio. Where they're in a dream, in a dream, in a dream. And they have to have something uh, with them on hand to remind themselves that they're in a dream. Yeah. So a little token. So this is just a dream. I decided to pick the silver foil unicorn from Blade Runner. Yeah. So when I was uh, in my V Inception lab, I would hold on to this thing going, and none of this is real. It's all virtual. But what I'm getting at is the possibility that we have inside the cloud director, ESX, running inside a virtual machine with the virtual center server appliance. And then when you log into it, it looks like any other virtual center environment, except it's actually not a physical box that you're seeing, but yet another virtual machine. Yeah? I've even had this idea that these levels of inception could have different numbers. So level zero is the physical world with vSphere. Level one is vSphere running on vSphere. And level two is a VM running on vSphere in a virtual machine on vSphere. Yeah? So that's the dream, side the dream, side the dream. Wouldn't it be great if one of the vCloud service providers actually offered this as a service? Yeah? So rather than going to bare metal clouds, you go to Ireland or Tarimark and dial up a home lab. What I'm talking about is something that VMware has been doing a while in the hands-on labs at VMworld. Yeah? So if you've ever done labs at VMworld, a lot of that stuff is all just virtual. Yeah? Um, the network target they use for storage is free in that environment. Probably the biggest challenge I would say with this sort of level of nesting is the IOPS that come from disk. What, what I did in my V Inception lab is I created a network directly to the storage layer. So although the, these uh, ESX hosts running in virtual machines, 
When they write to storage, they're actually writing natively to my NetApp files and my ecologics, which means I get all the benefits of VI and VASA, all the offloading. So the performance is actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, what I've been trying to do is convince some of our vCloud service providers to do this. I think some of them look at it and think it's a lot of work to be done. But my, what I'm trying to do is convince them that if you as an individual dialed up a home lab with Ireland and you had a good experience, the next time you decide, mm, I want to use vCloud Connector to move VMs from my private cloud into the public cloud, maybe you'd go back to Ireland because of your initial experience with them. So do it like a, a loss leader, a kind of a way of bringing customers in. I haven't had much success in, in convincing them to do this, but maybe that will happen. So uh, my future, new servers, more servers, a memory upgrade. Do I stay where I am in the co-location? Do I carry on just paying now? Do I try and get my employer to pay for it? I think um, the chances of getting my employer to pay for me for hardware that sits in my facility is quite small. But if I could go back to my manager and say, I want to spin up this remote lab environment in the cloud, and the monthly cost is $25. Maybe you would agree to that? And if I could say to them, and that's $24 for the next six months, and after that we terminate the subscription, maybe he would approve that. Maybe my corporate credit card that I have from VMware, maybe I could just use that to get my lab environment. Maybe I would get into trouble doing that. I have been videoed, of course. Hope my boss doesn't see this. But anyway, I hope that's given you some ideas about some of the challenges of, of vCloud Director, how it changes the way you look at vSphere and the way you partition your resources. And I hope I've given you some ideas, if you don't have a home lab already, what your options are. If you do have a home lab, what I would suggest to you is the days of knowing just ESX and Virtual Center and that being enough for you to have a future career or job security, I think is closing as a window. Yeah. Us as a community need to move on. We need to move on to other technologies like Vue, like Site Recovery Manager, like vCloud. Yeah? Um, pretty quickly, the vSphere virtualization skills are going to be commoditized. Yeah? It's a bit like what happened to Microsoft vCPs. Years ago, that vCP was worth a lot, but the more VC, uh, Microsoft certified professionals came along, the more devalued that qualification came. We're already seeing it now with the uh, the VCAPs, the advanced certifications, and the certifications that are particularly at desktop, particularly at cloud. And that's the direction I think we need to, to go in. Don't rely just on ESX and virtual center. You need something on top of that, I think, for the future. But thanks very much. Thank you for your time.